today's Bible Deep Dive. This is Matthias 76, and together we are decoding the deception. Welcome back. We're going to continue our study of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, the 13th chapter. Today we pick up with the 14th verse. And what I want to do just to get us back up to speed, I'm going to read verses 12 and 13 where we closed yesterday. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So we are focused called, exhorted to stand firm and to stand firm unto the end. Now, it's important to remember what Jesus is doing here. He is giving a prophetic vision of the future. And remember, Jesus is our prophet, our priest, our king. Here he's telling about what's going to transpire in the future. But we need to remember when a prophet looks into the future, when they speak about the future, it is as though they're looking through time going forward, and the events of the future are laid out on panes of glass, so they can look through one and see the other. And for them, the perspective of a sequence of time isn't necessarily the way it will play out. They just see all the events of the future, and so they will talk about one and then another. They don't necessarily distinguish as to this one comes first, then this, and then that. They just see the future and they talk about it. It's the way it works in the Old Testament, it is the way it works here. And that's going to play out for us right now. Jesus says in verse 14, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. We're going to stop right there. The abomination that causes desolation. The people of Jesus' day understood very well what he was talking about when he said this. In 167 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes, a Syrian king, had erected an altar to Zeus over the altar in the temple, over the altar of burnt offering, and he sacrificed a pig on it, an unclean animal for the Jews. He sacrificed a pig on it. That was prophesied in advance by Daniel a few different times in Daniel 9.27, Daniel 11.31, and Daniel 12.11. So Jesus is referring to that event of the past, but giving it as a future warning. The first thing that this warns of, and the main thing that this warns of, is the desolation of the temple, the desecration of the temple, and the destruction of the of the temple that came about when the Romans came in 70 AD, approximately 40 years after Jesus gave this warning, came in 70 AD and laid waste, laid siege to Jerusalem, laid waste to it, and literally tore down the temple. So that is what he is talking about first and foremost. And he says, let those who are in Judea, flee to the mountains. And many Christians at that time, because they had been warned by Jesus through the gospel writers, did flee and get out of Jerusalem. And he talks about the urgency of that. He says, let no one on the roof of his house go back down and enter to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back and get his cloak. How dreadful it will be for how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that it will not take place in winter because 
Those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, now we'll stop there at verse 20. I don't want to bite off too much at one time because there is so much here. So what we have play out here is an example of what we talked about of prophecy looking forward into the future. He's talking about two things, and he's talking about two things at the same time because many of the same warnings apply. When you start to see the warnings, whether it was for the Jews in Jerusalem and the warning of the Romans coming, get out, run away. It's not going to be good, and it wasn't good. It was horrible. It was a terrible event, the, the anguish and torment that the people who were surrounded and besieged in Jerusalem went through. It is truly a sad tale. But he's saying there's no time to delay. When you start to see warning signs, run, go, be prepared. He's talking also about the warning signs for the end times. Once you start to see these warning signs, you need to be on guard. You need to be alert. He says that so many times just through this chapter, nine times. He says that in different ways. Be on guard, be alert, watch out. It's going to be very, very difficult. But he's giving us the warnings. He's telling us what is going to take place. And we know, as we begin to go into here, verse 20, we know that he's talking both about this, the destruction of Jerusalem and the end times when he's going to come again because of what he says in verse 20 and following. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. So here it is easy to see. It is clear to see that Jesus is talking about the events of the end times. We see that first of all because what he says, if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. Let's talk about this first. Look at the tense that Jesus uses here if the Lord had not cut short those days. Well, that's a past tense, specifically. It's a perfect tense. Talking about something that is completed, it's done, and is staying done. It's Why a past tense here? This is what's referred to as a prophetic perfect. The prophets often talked about things that were yet to come, but talked about them in the past sense. And the message is, it is so sure, so certain that these things are going to take place that the Holy Spirit leads the prophets to talk about it in the past tense. You can't get more sure and certain than that. If the Lord had not cut short those days... No one would survive. This is talking about the end times because in reality, in Jerusalem, in the siege of Jerusalem with Titus in 70 AD, very, very few survived. It was so terrible that the citizens of Jerusalem were reduced to cannibalism to survive. And when the Romans finally broke through, those who ha were still alive were hauled off into slavery, taken to uh, Rome and used as fodder in the gladiatorial games. So none of them survived, those who stayed in Jerusalem. 
but for the sake of the elect whom God has chosen, he has shortened them. Let us stop and absorb, appreciate the severity of what he's talking about, how bad it will be. That if the Lord did not cut those days short, no one would survive. This foretells a level of persecution that is hard and frightful to imagine. We think we've seen persecution in the church around the world thus far, and certainly in other places in the world, the church has undergone tremendous persecution. With that, we should be reminded that every place around the world where the church has been severely persecuted, and we're talking about martyrdom, we're talking about people being executed for their faith, in those places, there is always one thing in common. The church has flourished. The gospel has expanded. Souls have been saved. How interesting. How interesting that where there is persecution, the church grows. Where there is comfort and leisure and peace and rest and prosperity, the church stagnates. Amazing. But if the Lord had not cut short those days, he will. But if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. We read in Ephesians 1.22, talking about Jesus, and God placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. So important to remember. Everything is under God's control. Everything is under his authority. It doesn't always look that way in this sinful world. The reality is, is that in this world, nothing is as it seems. We could talk about that at length. But nothing is as it seems. In spite of the way it looks, this is the message, in spite of the way it looks, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the one who loves us so much that he came here to live and die in order to forgive us, in order to save us, he is always in charge and he rules all things. He rules all things for the church, it tells us there in Ephesians 1.22. Now, we're not going to dive into the depths of what it means that there are the elect, but suffice it to say this, when the Holy Spirit in Scripture talks about election, it is always about comfort and assurance of salvation. But all things are ruled for the sake of the elect. It doesn't matter how it looks. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. Jesus is still in charge. and. Jesus always wins. But as it gets so bad, as it digresses, as people are persecuted, and who knows what all goes on, we can only imagine. At that time, when it's so bad, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. What Jesus is saying here is this. When he returns, and he's going to make this clear later in the same chapter, when Jesus returns, no one will be able to miss it. He says in verse 26, At that time men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and authority and all of his angels with him. It tells us no one is going to be able to miss that. So if someone tells you, if someone tells you that Jesus is here, and you didn't see him coming in the clouds, guess what? Then it is a lie. <laughs> it is a lie. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform many signs to deceive the elect, if that were possible. 
false Christs. We need to give this some thought. Many have put themselves forward as saviors. They've put themselves forward as prophets who were not in the church. When we think of false Christ, we always think of it being someone who was in the church. And I think that we perhaps narrow the scope down too small. There are many political leaders who have put themselves out there, tyrants, who have put themselves out there as saviors, as, in effect, messiahs. But we are not to believe them. We will know. He will make it unmistakably clear. He has told us. We have it in writing. We will be able to tell when it's him who has come back. I should say there are even those who believe that there is technology being worked on to be used to deceive people into thinking that the Christ has returned, the ability to project things into the sky, the technology that we have is amazing. And I keep reminding myself of this. Don't sell short. We should not sell short how deep this deception is going to be. False Christs and false prophets will appear and perform mirac signs and miracles, signs and miracles to deceive the elect if that were possible. If that were possible. But the, the elect cannot be deceived, but it is a statement of how severe, how extreme, how deceptive Things will be in the end times. If it is so bad that it would deceive the elect, if that were possible, praise God, thank God it is not. But if it's so bad that it could deceive the elect, then how bad will it be? Then it is little wonder that Jesus says, be on your guard. I have told you everything in advance. Thus far, thus far, if we're wondering, how concerned should I be? Have you ever asked that about something? Oh, there's a big storm coming. You know, somebody's really worked up about it, and they've obviously heard about it, and you haven't, and you might, might inquire of them. How concerned should I be? Well, thus far, we are 23 verses into the 13th chapter of Mark. It goes through 34 verses. So far, in verse 5, Jesus said, watch out. In 7, do not be alarmed. In 9, you must be on your guard. In 11, do not worry. And in 18, pray. And now, be on your guard. I think he's concerned that we are vigilant, that we're watchful, that we are looking and not allowing ourselves to be deceived. And he says, I have told you everything ahead of time. He is exercising great concern and compassion for us. He wants us to be informed. It's our responsibility to heed that warning, to take it seriously, to not allow ourselves to become slothful and sleep when we should be awake. Verse 24, But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. This will be impossible to miss. You know, there's a thing that we do in reading Scripture. If you read Scripture often, I know it happens to me. We read it so often, we've read it so many times for some of us since we were toddlers going to Sunday school, hearing the same accounts of what Jesus did and said over and over again, that we get to where we don't really think about them. 
And that's dangerous. We don't want that to happen to us. It is good to read the scripture and force yourself to think about it as though you've never read it before and pray that the Spirit gives you insight, that he opens your heart to receive what it is that the Holy Spirit is saying here in this text and think about what he says. The sun will be darkened. And we're not talking about some kind of eclipse type thing. It says the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Now think about that. Try to imagine that. Try to envision that. What does it look like when the heavenly bodies are shaken? What does it look like when the stars fall from the sky and the sun is darkened and the moon doesn't give his light? If you didn't know what that signified, it would be so terrifying. But thank God, we're blessed to know what it will signify because Jesus is telling us in advance. Jesus is telling us in advance. These are two different passages, two different quotations by Jesus from Isaiah. One, Isaiah 13, verse 10, and the second, Isaiah 34, verse 4. At that time, when these things happen, after the sun is darkened and the moon not giving us light and the stars falling from the sky and the heavenly bodies being shaken, Saturn, Jupiter, all of them, at that time, Men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and authority. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. Jesus is going to come on the clouds. No one will be able to miss it. They may, through some kind of technology and some deceptive move, try to fake that at some time. Who knows? Who knows? But when he comes, we will be able to tell for real because the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, stars will fall from the sky, etc. He says, and he will send his angels and gather the elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. He comes, he gathers, his angels reap a harvest. And judgment isn't mentioned here, but it is a foregone conclusion. And judgment isn't mentioned here because he's talking to the believers. He's talking to his disciples. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the, the fab four. For us, there is no judgment. There is no judgment, only salvation. Now learn this, and yesterday... In the previous broadcast, this is where we began because I have this on part of the introduction and, and part of the closing of every video that we produce. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Jesus is the master teacher, and he is the master teacher because he uses everyday things to teach profound truths. Here it's a fig tree. You can tell. You can tell when it's twigs get tender when it's ready to bud and when the leaves are going to come out, you can tell that that's going to happen. You can tell that summer is near. You know that. Jesus is giving us all the things. This is the message. He is giving us all the things for which we should be watching and waiting. Therefore, we will know and not be surprised. Knowing all the signs is a blessing. Even so, when you see these things happening, these signs that he's given, you know that it is near. 
right at the door. You know because you were watching. You know because you were waiting. You're praying. You're staying alert. And you're being on guard. This generation will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. This generation. Here he's talking about the generation of all believers in the New Testament era. We are the generation of the New Testament era. The era between when Christ ascended to heaven and when he comes again in judgment. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Heaven and earth, these things that we take for granted, terra firma, it's solid, it's stable. If you've ever been through an earthquake, you know it's very unsettling because that which you take for granted, that on which you walk, that which is the foundation for everything is shaken. It's very unnerving. So imagine how unnerving it would be to have that pass away. Everything here can be gone. Everything here will be gone. It will perish in fire. Therefore, none of it matters. None of it. But Jesus tells us, but my words will never pass away. God's word, hold on to it. Cherish it. It is the greatest blessing. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Everything else will pass away. God's word will never pass away. And finally, verse 32, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. It's a fascinating thing and very curious to us when Jesus says, no one knows that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Suffice it to say, in his state of humiliation, as a man. Jesus still had all of the attributes of God. He still was God, but he chose to not make use of all of those attributes, his omniscience, his omnipotence, etc. So even Jesus, even Jesus doesn't know the day, but the Father does. Be on guard, be alert. We've talked about how many times Jesus gives warnings here for vigilance. Nine times in this chapter alone, because we don't know when, but we know the signs. I don't know the day. I don't know the time. No one can, but I know the signs. And he has given us all our assigned task, each one with his assigned task. I can't help but think of one of my favorite passages when Jesus ascended into heaven. And it's it's this neat picture. The disciples are standing there gazing into heaven and the angel appears to them and says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. They were saying, don't just stand there. You've got things to do. He gave you work to do. He has given us work to do. The spread of the gospel is our work. And for those of us who know these signs, we are in effect, certainly pastors, preachers, teachers are at the door keeping watch, but we all have those that we care for. We all have those for whom we have accountability and Christian responsibility And we need to warn them. We are at the door. 
And what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This really is the summation and application of this chapter. Be informed, be prepared, be in the Word, and be ready to decode the deception. That concludes our Bible deep dive. We encourage you to go to our website, and there on the home page, down in the lower left, we have a place that you can give us your email address. We don't want to let the social media technocrats keep us apart. Remember, YouTube can shut us down at any time. We have a backup plan, and we promise we won't use your email address for any other purpose. We need your support. You can do that on our website at the support page. It's very simple also down below. There's a link to Patreon and our PayPal page. You can support us there. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up down below. And if you like it, please consider sharing. We would love to have you subscribe. And if you subscribe, please remember to click that bell so you get notified when we put out new content. Finally, down below, leave your comments. We love to hear from you. That feedback means a great deal to us. This is Matthias 76. We are decoding the deception. God bless and have a great day.